Once you complete the patient interview and examination, the patient's psychological assessment and the radiographic analysis of the tooth, you're now ready to sit down for a few minutes and mentally extract the tooth. Now, nobody ever taught me this when I started taking teeth out, and I wish that they would have. Now, it seems trivial, but if you can live all the surprises in your mind prior to taking that tooth out, there will fail to be any surprises. So what I mean is you sit down, you take all that information that you've gathered from those first three assessments that we've done, and we start going through the scenarios. So we're gonna say, okay, we'll start non-surgically, for example. We're gonna try our elevator and we're gonna try our forceps. So you determine, can we do that? And if we do do that, where's our elevator most likely going to be on that tooth to have the best chance of success? If that tooth is going to break, where's the weakest point? Where is it likely to fracture if I put a forcep on it? If that happens, what instruments do I need? You need to have these in the operatory. Don't have them open necessarily, but you have them right there in case you need them. At what point do you pick up a handpiece? Know this in your mind. Have it ready to go before you do the extraction. You should have, I would say, at least three scenarios for every tooth you take out, no matter how simple it looks. So complications can happen with even the most easy looking extractions and if you're ready for them, it's no big deal. We're gonna use this tooth here as an example for extraction planning. So we're gonna talk about how you might progress through a tooth if things don't go as planned. So we're gonna have a scenario A, scenario B, and scenario C. So scenario A is you look at this tooth and let's say that you don't have a lot of experience. So now you're going to look at it and you're going to think, okay, well maybe we'll try our elevator on here and our forceps, which is what we normally do with the tooth. So we're going to apply our elevator onto that mesial buccal aspect of the tooth because the distal is all decayed. So what you do is you start to elevate on that tooth and you're not getting a lot of movement. So again, rookie mistake, you're going to grab your forcep and you're going to try to force that tooth to move. Now when you do that, the crown snaps off. So our crown is gone. Now, if you haven't prepared ahead of time, this is a scary situation. But we're now gonna move on to scenario B, which we've already planned in our minds, and we know exactly what we're gonna do next. Anytime that a tooth breaks on you, take a minute, stop, and reestablish good visibility, good light, and good access. Those are your three surgical principles. Take a minute to do it. Sometimes when you get working at a tooth, you get focused on it, maybe your assistant's getting focused in, nobody's moving the overhead light, or the retraction is getting a little poorer as you're going. Get everything optimal. Get in there and irrigate that site with sterile saline and suction it out really well. If any tissue or tooth fragments are obscuring your view of what's left there, remove them with a the hemostat and get everything very, very clean and very clear so that you can distinguish what is tooth and what is bone. Now, as you get better at extractions, at this point, you're not going to be sweating like you would be when you first start out. So usually if you break a tooth when you first start, your heart rate goes up, you perspire a little bit, and you're starting to have doubts about whether or not you're going to get this tooth out. As you get going with extractions and you get better at this, now you go, oh, that was inconvenient, but I guess we're halfway done. So it gets better, trust me. Now when you look down at this tooth in particular, the nice part about it is you've got gutta perca there. So you've got basically three points of gutta perca that you'll see that are showing where those roots are located. Now this is really handy for sectioning. So we're gonna pick up our handpiece next and we're gonna cut between those roots. So when we're dividing the roots, what we need to know is we need to stay clear of that lingual of the mandible. But other than that, our critical anatomy is pretty far away. So we're pretty much in the clear when we're sectioning this particular tooth. So we section this tooth, we then use our instrument of choice, and mine would be the EL3SX Luxator. I put it in down next to that mesial root, and I start to work at that a little bit, and we're gonna loosen it up and push it in to where we've sectioned that tooth and removed some structure to be able to get some clearance for the root to come out. So that root comes out quite nicely. And what we do then is we're gonna take our elevator and we're gonna now work it between the distal and the third root. So we're gonna work it in against the accessory root to get things moving in either direction. So we're using the other root that's available there as leverage to get some motion on that third root. We then go and we deliver the distal root using either you know, your spade elevator or your elevating luxator, whatever you like to use, you get that tooth out. And now you go and you try to get that third root out. Now you've managed to loosen it and you've managed to luxate it a bit with that instrument you were using. 
but it's still pretty firmly bound in there and we're having troubles getting it to move. So our initial approach of our luxator, for example, isn't working. What do we do next? We're having some difficulty establishing a purchase point on this third route or this accessory route. Part of it is that we're not used to dealing with these. The other part is that there's just bone all the way around there. So it's broken off basically flush with the bone and we can't get an instrument in there. Our option now is to remove some more bone using either a handpiece or an instrument. So you could use a crier elevator to basically get in there, scoop some bone away from the inner radicular region, and then get that root out with that wheel and axle motion. We'll talk about that in another video. Or you could pick up your handpiece and you can artificially create a purchase point. So what you're doing with that is you're using a 699 or a 700 surgical length burr in your surgical handpiece, and you're creating a trough around that root structure at the expense of the tooth more than the bone. Now what you're doing is you're creating space for the instrument, so you're creating a purchase point, and you're also removing any bony obstructions or anything that might be anchoring that root in place, preventing it from coming out. So once you do that, you make that little trough, you can then place an instrument and get a good purchase in there, and you're going to lever that tooth out or luxate it up so that the root pops out from the socket. When we're finished with that, any time that we've got an extraction like this where we've broken the tooth, we've been cutting bone or breaking bits of bone, you need to get in there with a curette, you need to get to the base of that apex, and you need to go all the way up the walls on all sides of that socket, get all those little bits and pieces out, use your small suction to get down in there, irrigate it well with sterile saline, and then basically have the patient bite some wet gauze and hold it in there for 20 minutes, change it as necessary, and you've just successfully removed a tooth that looked like it was going to be a really tough one. And the reason you could do it is that you had your extraction planned ahead of time, you had your instruments available, and when things happened, you knew exactly how to respond, and you did it efficiently. <laughs>